All right, good morning. Sorry, I'm late today. I have a few technical problems today. I don't know if you guys as well are uh, able, unable to sign into OneDrive and stuff, but that's been a, seems to be an issue for me today. <coughs> And normally I use that to sync my lectures. So fortunately I noticed before I left school. But <laughs> okay. So uh, last time we were talking about uh, hardness and alkalinity. We sort of left off right as we got to alkalinity. And today I want to talk about um, how, how do we compute alkalinity and then what does that mean for softening? How do we um, kind of calculate how much how water softening goes, I guess. <laughs> Only a little bit. <laughs> All right. So that's that's the plan today. I want to talk about um, alkalinity and softening. Uh, really going through one of the example problems in the book. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what we can do with that, um, what sense we can make of it. Uh, there's another example in the book that I'll probably recommend you take a look at. It's probably a little bit closer to some of the um, uh, problems in the homework assignment, um, dealing with alkalinity and kind of calculating alkalin alkalinity based on um, water quality parameters that have been measured. And so that's um, example 6.6. .6. And I think you've got a, a homework problem or two that are dealing with that type of a system. At any rate, the uh, softening side of it um, can be, um, you know, we can get, I want to cover that and get there from kind of the uh, alkalinity standpoint. So last time we talked about, um, alkalinity and essentially we have two types of alkalinity uh, one would be what we call carbonate alkalinity so alkalinity that is really and, and again alkalinity is essentially the ability for water to absorb protons so uh, h plus absorb acid take in acid without a significant change in ph and you might be thinking to yourself well if we're adding if we're adding protons and we're changing the pH, right? That, that's the definition. But what you'll notice is if you add a proton and that causes some sort of equilibrium reaction to shift a little bit, um, or you know, it is essentially accounted for in an equilibrium reaction. So let's say H2CO3 is in equilibrium with HCO3 minus and H plus. We have that going on and we have our typical water then in fact if we are adding H plus then some of these H pluses are not staying in solution they're being combined to form some other molecule right so it's a way we we call it buffering um, we can buffer the solution to slow that transition down now if we add enough H plus of course then pretty much all of the HCO3 minus is now in um, H2CO3 form, and we have a lot of H plus hanging around. Um, so equilibrium is involved, right? So the point being, there is that aspect where not all of the H plus is directly impacting the acidity because of these reactions. So the different species that can participate in the reactions, the carbonate system is one in particular. So if we're talking about carbonate alkalinity, we have to account for one um, proton capacity for every HCO3 minus, two proton capacity for every CO3 two minus, and one for every OH minus, um, minus that of how much is already there, right? So that's the definition of carbonate hardness or carbonate alkalinity, excuse me. And we can put that in terms of milli equivalents. So when we put these little brackets, uh, the um, rather than use the brackets, excuse me, so that's for moles per liter, if we use just parentheses, 
here, we can use that to denote these milli equivalents per liter. Okay, and that's kind of what we talked about last time with the equivalence, equivalencies. So the non-carbonate alkalinity is essentially the other stuff in solution that, that are going to be demanding um, or capable of uh, taking on the H+, plus, satisfying that um, in other capacities. So we'll, we'll get to that as we're looking at the softening. Um, I think I either forgot to put the book's explicit definition or there wasn't one, and it's just basically the other stuff, right? Um, so we'll, we'll try to sort that out, and I was realizing that as I brought this up, but I don't think I have a specific um, definition there. Um, so I'll, I'll probably revisit that for you. But it, it is essentially the other stuff, right? So if you think about what else can buffer or absorb those um, protons, if you have something like CaOH2, well, when you dissolve this, it's going to be Ca2 plus and 2 OH minus. And so those OH minuses are obviously going to contribute here. Um, but essentially, the other aspect of this is that calcium allows to, is essentially serving to counterbalance um, anions. And so it allows for the presence of more anions in solution than if it was just the OH minus there, because that has to be balanced by, um, you know, so when, when you put this in solution, obviously that's balanced. But then if you're taking away these essentially by adding acid, then this two plus here is still providing in some way a buffering capacity that it's allowing for maybe a CO3 two minus or something like that. So there's an aspect there of the charge neutrality that um, that takes place. So let's take a look at example 6.5. It's a very simple problem prompt. It says a water a sample of water at pH 10 has 32 milligrams per liter of CO3 two minus. Find the alkalinity as CaCO3. So quite quite a, uh, a problem prompt there. So I have a couple of fields to, to target to fill in. That would be finding the molar concentration of carbonate, the equivalent weight of calcium carbonate, or as, as calcium carbonate, um, and bicarbonate. So we'll take a look through the solutions and walk through those in a minute. But I want to give you a, a moment to think about Okay, what is, what is alkalinity? How are we going to go about this? Um, so remember, we defined alkalinity a moment ago in either moles per liter or milliequivalents per liter based on those species. So for the moment, let's just, you know, we have a system. We're pretty much given only carbonate is in the system. So we'll assume that this is all carbonate alkalinity. So solve it, solve it for that, or work towards a solution for that.
Okay, so the first part is, you know, I, I put these prompts up here to kind of follow a few things that you're going to need according to the solution that we'll, we'll talk through in a moment. But the first part would be to simply solve, okay, we've got some amount of carbonate, we have a molecular weight, that's three times the oxygen, which is 16 each, so that's 48 plus carbon is 12, so 60. Um, and so that, that would be the, that would give us, if we take the uh, 32 milligrams per liter of the car uh, carbonate, divide that by 60, multiply that by one over a thousand, that's gonna give us 5.33 times 10 to the minus fourth, moles per liter. Now, that's not the most useful uh, unit for this type of problem because um, essentially what we're going to do is convert into these milliequivalents or really what they're looking for is alkalinity as CaCO3. So if we look back to the previous slide, we kind of have, so we have alkalinity this way in moles per liter and then alkalinity as milliequivalents per liter. Um, but if we remember from last time, um, and it kind of makes a note here, these brackets, uh, excuse me, these parentheses instead of the brackets, concentrations in milliequivalents per liter or milligrams as CaCO3. So if you convert to um, milligrams per liter as CaCO3, then essentially you've done that molar conversion already. You've built that into the unit. And so you can just use the brackets in this manner which also accounts for how much, um, how many molecules there are or how many um, protons are being accounted for because of the definition of doing that equivalent weight stuff. So if we recall that equivalent weight um, of CaCO3, that's the 100 divided by two for the 100 um, grams per mole, the molecular weight, divided by the calcium has a plus two charge, right? So that's the N. So the grams per mole divided by the N, that's 100 divided by two, that's 50. And that we would say, we could call that milligram, you know, milligrams per liter as CaCO3. Um, okay, so that's that's part of this. Um, we'll, we'll go through the solution in a moment and you'll see these different components at play. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted you to just start on this part of it to get you thinking in these terms. Um, we'll connect some dots in a moment. The HCO3 minus, um, this we can get from our equilibrium equations. Since we're at pH 10, we can pretty much assume we've got almost none of this uh, H2CO3 or CO2 aqueous, right? H2CO3. Pretty much none of this is at play because we're so far above that pKa. We're up at pH 10, so we're, we're just going to neglect this, which is a fair assumption to do. Um, pH too high. And so we'll use this guy to solve for our HCO3 minus. So we can say HCO3 minus should be equal to the H plus times CO3 2 minus, which is one reason to might be worth going ahead and solving for that in moles per liter, divided by that K2, which was 4.68 times 10 to the minus 11th. Okay, so we can do that, and that would give us our solution there. Didn't write that one up yet. So I've got some of the stuff happening here already. What I want to do here is say that's going to be equal to H plus times CO3 2 minus divided by 4.5 six, eight times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, and that should be that many moles per liter. So 1.14. That's a negative fourth. 
the third. Okay, so there's a few points there. Um, let's go ahead and with that in mind and with the thought of, okay, well, alkalinity total is going to essentially be, like we said, the HCO3 minus, and I'm gonna put it in these brackets, so we're gonna need kind of everything in these brackets, or these, um, excuse me, the parentheses. Uh, we're going to need everything as CaCO3 since we're calculating, we're finding it as CaCO3. But it's essentially going to be that plus the CO3 2 minus plus the OH minus minus the H plus. Okay, and that's just like we said a moment ago. Okay, so we have essentially the, the basis to do it with the carbonate and the bicarbonate we just need to convert everything like that. So let's take a look. The book says that okay, we've got the equivalent weight of carbonate from our table 6.3. They said that's 30 milligrams per milli equivalent. So the equivalent weight, and I, I guess I probably misspoke there. No, no, I, that was fine. So the equivalent weight for CaCO3 is 100, which is the molecular weight of CaCO3 divided by two. The equivalent weight for CO3 to minus is the 60 mil, uh, grams per mole divided by two, because there's two a two minus charge there. So that's equal to 30 milli equivalents per milligram. Is it milligram per milli equivalent? I think milligram. Per milli equivalent. Okay, so that's what they're doing right here with the, the 30. That's provided in a table, but again, we can we could just solve that. So we'll say equivalent weight for CO three. Okay, so that's where that's coming from. That's right there. Okay, so then what they're doing is they're saying, okay, well, let's get this uh, carbonate. And rather than solve for the um, the molar concentration, they just took the milligrams because we have this in milligrams per milli equivalent. Um, and I guess I can be a little more elaborate with that. So it's 60 grams per mole. And we're dividing that by two essentially charge equivalents per mole. And so what that does is we get rid of the moles and that becomes 30 um, grams per equivalent, which we can divide both the top and the bottom by a thousand to get to milli. And it doesn't change anything except we can say that's also 30 milli milligrams per milli equivalent. So 30 milligrams per milli equivalent charge. Okay, so that's what's going in there. And so taking that route, you don't even need to do, um, I mean, it, it's accounting for the, the charge, or excuse me, the molecular weight all in that. Okay, then multiply that by the 50 milligrams of CaCO3 per milli equivalent. That's coming from this guy, right? the equivalent weight of CaCO3. So when we're accounting for everything in the, that term to find it as CaCO3, that's what we have to do. Essentially multiply all these guys by 50 so that we end up with those units are going to be, so it's 53.3 milligrams per liter as CaCO3 because when we multiply that across, this is milligram CaCO3 per milli equivalent. We're dividing that by um, milligrams per milli equivalent and multiplying it by milligrams of this carbonate. 
So the milligrams here cancel with these, the milliequivalents are still there, and then they get that gets canceled with this milliequivalent, and then we're left with milligrams of CaCO3. And the only other thing left is the per liter. So it's milligrams CaCO3 per liter. Okay, so that gives us our answer, 53.3 milligrams as CaCO3 for the carbonate portion of it. So we need to do that for all of it. Um, it goes on to show kind of what, what I did in this part. We're taking a look at this at pH 10. It's essentially not going to be any carbonic acid at pH 10. It's going to be such a small number, we can ignore it. And then we can solve for the HCO3 minus. That's what I did. And I we found it to be 1.14 times 10 to the minus third moles per liter, or 1.14 millimol per liter. And so from here, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, well, let's just go ahead and take from the um, millimoles per liter, convert that to milliequivalents per liter. Um, to do so, it's they're saying that, well, the charge is one. And so for every one mole, there's one mole of charge. So it's really just 1.14 milliequivalents per liter of um, HCO3 minus. So to express that then as milligrams per liter as CaCO3, we take that milliequivalent, multiply it by the 50 milligram CaCO3 CO, per milliequivalent, and we get 57 milligrams as CaCO3. So that's a second um, value that we're going to use. Next, we need the OH minus and the H plus. And so... Here we have the H plus, that's 10 to the minus 10 moles per liter. The equivalent weight for H plus is one, because we have one charge, N is one, and the molecular the atomic weight is one. So it's one divided by one, one milliequivalent, milligram per milliequivalent. So that's just 10 to the minus 10 times um, one gram per mole to get it into gram quantities, times 10 to the third to get to um, milligrams and times 50 to get the as CaCO3. So that becomes um, 5 times 10 to the minus 6 milligrams per liter as CaCO3. So pretty small number compared to the other ones. And finally, we also know the OH minus concentration is um, 1 times 10 to the minus 4th. That's because we we remember that the water relationship here is is that, so our Kw for water is 10 to the minus 14th. So we can always solve for OH minus if we have the pH. Um, so again, just a, a quick reminder, I am assuming you're gonna know this and be able to do this, but the equilibrium constant for water is 10 to the minus 14. It's always just simply H plus times OH minus. So that's what they're doing here to find OH minus. That's one times 10 to the minus four moles per liter. <clears throat> the hydroxyl concentration is therefore, um, again, the same process. We're gonna express it as CaCO3. So that's that moles per liter times that molecular weight. If you take oxygen, which is 16, add one for the hydrogen, that's 17 grams per mole. Multiply that by 1,000 milligrams per gram. Divide that by the 17 milligrams per milliequivalent. And multiply that by 50 milligrams CaCO3 per milliequivalent. That gives us 5 milligrams per liter as CaCO3. And then we just add all those pieces. So this is really just solving for each of these components, so each uh, each part of the alkalinity that we needed, just kind of expressing those, getting them in order, getting them as CaCO3, and adding them together um, to get our final alkalinity as 115.3 mill milligrams per liter as CaCO3. And one thing you, you might notice here is the contribution of H plus is pretty small, right? That's 
you know, if we were to, to write that out in the rounding error, we would need six more digits out. <laughs> so certainly um, you could take a shortcut if you needed to and just ignore that altogether since our pH was so high. Um, of course, if our, we had a lower pH, that might not, not be so reasonable. Um, yeah, okay. So any questions? Does that kind of make sense? Yes. So for the H plus, I just that, missed that one. Yeah. yeah, that was right here. Oh, and I'm probably in the way for it. So the H plus is um, one times ten to the minus ten. So that's our definition for the moles per liter here, um, given the pH is ten. We're going to multiply that by one gram per mole. Um, that's the atomic weight for H. Convert that into milligrams um, here by multiplying by 1,000. And then we're also dividing it by that equivalent weight. So it's, it's really the same process we've been doing. It's just kind of written out slightly different. Um, it, part of the difference here, by the way, is for the carbonate, we were given that unit in milligrams per liter. So we had to handle that a little differently than when we're solving for H plus because H plus is going to be in moles per liter. So anyway, it's just unit conversions to get to milligram CaCO3 per milliequivalent. It's the same process we did for the OH. Okay, so that brings us to water softening. And there's two general approaches we can take, which are ion exchange processes. Typically it's going to be like a resin um, or beads of resin. So it'll just be this polymer kind of stuff that's got, um, we can make some sort of substance that absorbs water pretty well and interacts with water favorably in that manner. Um, these are what you're typically going to have the ion exchange for in home units because you're not going to be managing the addition of chemicals, the removal of sludge and all that sort of stuff that you, you would do in a, a water treatment plant. Instead, you're just gonna pass water over these a column of these beads um, and you have this ion exchange resin sort of thing happening. I, and I'll explain that in just a second. So the other option is what we call lime soda ash processes. And I'm not talking about like limes, sodas, or Sprite for that matter. Um, and ash, it's uh, actually, so soda ash, um, sodium bicarbonate, and, or actually sodium carbonate, soda ash, Na2CO3, and um, essentially limestone, um, or taking your precipitating limestone, you adding slaked lime, so CaOH2. So um, the ion exchange process and we're just going to touch on it briefly. Um, it is pretty convenient. We do use it in a lot of laboratories for purifying water uh, further. So deionizing the water. Essentially what's going to happen is you're going to exchange ions. You have to keep charge equivalents. Um, so that's going to, the charge balance of solution is going to be a big deal. Um, however, if you do it smart in a smart manner, first of all, you can remove hardness by taking, for example, and exchanging two calciums from water, um, going and swapping with four sodiums from this ion exchange resin. So if the resin is packed full of these sodiums and it's actually kind of willing to, to, take, to take these multivalent cations, so calcium, magnesium, metals, it'll be happy to take those and kick off these sodiums, which are kind of more loosely bound instead so that keeps the charge balance so you've got these sodiums coming back into solution while taking the the calcium or magnesium or other stuff so if you remember when we were talking about hardness it wasn't just cations it was actually multivalent cations so we'll say the uh, some sort of a concentration of multivalent cations
So in that way, this is directly softening the water. Um, we're not changing the, um, the concentration of ions, but we are changing the ionic strength. Because if you remember the ionic strength, that equation has to do with not just the concentrations, but also their charges squared. So if, if you take, if you have one mole per liter of calcium, that's going to be one times that two squared. So that's going to be uh, four here divided by two. So if you have one mole per liter of calcium, the ionic strength of just that is two um, moles per liter. If you had a sodium, you have one mole per liter times its charge is one, divide that by two, and you get half, right? And even if you were exchanging, let's say, two sodiums for every one calcium, so you have two moles per liter, that's still going to just be one. The ionic strength is one compared to the ionic strength of two for the calcium case. So just wanted to show that that's, you know, by re reducing the hardness through ion exchange, it's not just the hardness, it's also the ionic strength. So they're, they're obviously related there. Okay, so that's kind of neat. You can also do this not just with the cations, but you can also do anion exchange processes. And if you do them in tandem, sometimes I, I think what you can do is kind of trick your solution to um, not have so many ions in the first place. If you're simultaneously removing cations on one side and anions on the other, I think you can actually have a net removal of ions as well. Um, it takes a little bit more processing that way. It, typically what you would do to get rid of the sodium at some point is either reverse osmosis or you could also potentially uh, distill it. Um, anyway, the ion exchange is um, quite, quite a useful process, a lot simpler than adjusting the pH and all that. So in terms of small scale systems, you're almost always looking at ion exchange. It can be kind of expensive, at least for large volumes of water. So you're not going to have those types of systems for municipalities, um, something like a laboratory scale, home scale, it's um, affordable enough. Um, but for all the water that's going to go water the lawn, you don't really care so much, right? So if you're distributing a whole bunch of water and a lot of it's going to escape through the pipes anyway, or you know, go who knows where, you really don't need to pay that, that type of process. Uh, cost. So that brings us to the, the lime soda ash processes. And essentially, these ones are going to rely on precipitation. So we're, we're actually going to add a lot of things in, in a way that's going to feel counterintuitive. So we're going to add this, the same type of stuff that we're trying to remove in many cases, in order to precipitate stuff and manipulate the chemistry to either drive off CO2 um, or precipitate uh, solids to remove, um, essentially remove hardness. This can really only reach um, about 40 milligrams per liter as CaCO3 hardness. That is in the soft regime. If we look at any of our little uh, indicator things, I think the softness, we're rated as soft water if it's anywhere below 50 milligrams per liter as CaCO3. So that's plenty, um, a plenty fine good number in terms of um, you know municipal water that we like to to have you know the that kind of aesthetic or um, arbitrary standard that users will like it if it's in that range that works great um, but if we did want it for something more industrial that's really um, sensitive to scaling maybe it's going to do high temperature interest you know different phs or something and potentially get some of the minerals to deposit, they may want to clean it up further. And in that case, you're going to want ion exchange or um, something like that. Okay, so how does it work? Um, it's a five-step plan to have a better life or whatever, except this is just water softening, right? So um, it, it's essentially five steps that you can, you can go through to stepwise take care of different aspects of the stuff in your system. Um, 
And then at the end of the day, you'll end up with water that is perhaps a little bit too basic. So a little bit, um, so the pH would be a little bit too high, which is actually another corrosive um, issue. So corrosivity is not simply, you know, you, you could think of acids as corrosive, but it's also true that if you, you're too basic, that becomes corrosive as well. Because really, when we talk about corrosivity, we're talking about conditions that will dissolve stuff. Um, so we don't want to leave it too corrosive. So the book mentions, you know, at the very end of the day, after our softening, one thing you might do is um, sparge your water with CO2, so bubbling CO2 back through it. That adds a little bit of acidity and um, restores a little bit of carbonate alkalinity uh, to the system, which is kind of funny because the whole thing you're starting with here is removing CO2. So it'll be, it'll feel counterintuitive kind of throughout, but it, the process actually does make sense at the end of the day. So step one is to remove the CO2, dissolve CO2. Um, and to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to switch back and forth pen colors and I'll say red will be remove. And we'll, we'll do, um, say, blue for addition. So in each step, we're adding something in order to remove something else. Okay. So in step one, we're removing CO2. We're going to add this slaked lime in order to do that. And what that's going to do is it's going to, essentially, we're, we're targeting the dissolved CO2, that's our um, carbonic acid essentially. And um, the way it's going to be removed from the system when we add this slaked lime, the CaOH2, is gonna be as a solid calcium carbonate, okay? So we're gonna, by simply adding the lime, that's adding calcium, that's also going to raise the pH a bit that's going to give conditions conducive for calcium to react with carbonate and essentially precipitate out calcium carbonate. Next up is to remove calcium carbonate hardness. All that stuff we just added, right? But what you notice is um, even though we were adding the calcium carbonate, we were also precipitating a bunch of that carbonate. Um, so we essentially removed excess dissolved CO2 in the water. To remove the calcium carbonate hardness then, we are aiming to remove um, essentially the combination of the calcium and bicarbonate here, again in the form of CaCO3. To do that, we're just actually adding more of that lime. So it's, it's you add enough to cause some precipitation, um, and that's and essentially, you're just going to keep adding and add some excess. And by the way, the um, the book describes, you know, when we're doing these reactions, it's actually pretty typical to add lime in a little bit of excess regardless. Um, that's just sort of convention in a way. So I think it's between 20 and 40 milligrams per liter of lime. And that might be as calcium carbonate. But regardless, that it's typical to add a bit excess, and it's kind of required to make the process go smoothly. Um, chances are there's some other things that may interfere um, with the processes. So it, it's just kind of a standard practice. Okay, so step three then is removal of calcium carbonate hardness, excuse me, magnesium carbonate hardness. So the magnesium side of stuff. And to do that, what we're, again, adding here is more lime. So more CaOH2. Targeting um, really whatever is going to come out as magnesium and some more carbonate. So we'll get some precipitation there. So more of the calcium carbonate. But at this point, we can get um, magnesium solids to precipitate as well. So it, 
essentially it, it's saying this is stepwise, but really all we're doing is adding the line. <laughs> That's just gonna, if we add enough, all of these will happen. But I think the deal is they're going to end up happening sequentially once there's no more excess CO2. Then we're gonna start getting our Ca CO3 to precipitate, the, the calcium that was in there to begin with. So it's kind of a matter of, um, you know, when, when we're adding it in this case, this time it is, we're adding as much Ca as is precipitating. And then in the next case, we're causing more to precipitate than we had, than we're adding because there's some in solution already. And then it's taking with it some carbonate. This, then once that's, uh, once that calcium is consumed, then magnesium will be the next favorable thing to start precipitating. And so it's, it is stepwise, even though it's in some sense, all sort of just happening because we're adding the line. Okay. So it's kind of an, an odd system in that manner. Step four, then we have removal of calcium non-carbonate hardness. And so here's the first time we're adding something that's not just lime. So here's where the soda ash comes in. We have calcium in solution. That's what we're targeting. And of course, we're going to precipitate that again as calcium carbonate. We're adding in this time the soda ash. So Na2CO3. So we're essentially adding extra carbonate because we've already removed basically all the carbonate that would possibly come out um, with the calcium and the magnesium, those are the, the calcium and magnesium um, carbonate uh, portions because those are associated. There was enough, you know, that was essentially the magnesium was balancing the carbonate in this, the, bi the bicarbonate here, or the calcium was balancing that bicarbonate. So when it precipitated, it pulled that other one with it. So we've removed all the, the carbonate from the system at this point, And so we actually have to add more carbonate because if there's more calcium remaining at this point, we have to add some more um, to get that to come out. And so what we're left with then is some solids and the Na plus, two Na pluses. Finally, that same process, we can get the magnesium non-carbonate hardness. And of course, each of these have this abbreviation, so Mg, NCH. We're targeting the magnesium. We're adding back some calcium surprisingly. So adding some lime and adding the soda ash. And what that's going to do for us is that's going to give conditions where we can actually remove the magnesium that we're, we're targeting. Um, we essentially are just going to precipitate back the calcium and the carbonate. Um, and we're going to precipitate that magnesium hydroxide solids. And we'll be left with a bit of uh, Na2 plus as well. Okay, so with all of that, it's it's kind of strange. A lot of times it feels like, oh, we just removed this. Why are we still adding it again? <laughs> um, but it, it kind of takes away sequentially different components of the system uh, that can precipitate. This will actually, um, there's a, a good visualization that um, both the, the two example problems in the book that come up next at this point, um, both deal with, I'm going to show you one of them in a minute. Um, and again, I, I think it would be worthwhile taking a good look at these examples more so than, than we do um, in the class. So there, that's 6.6 .6 and 6.7. And I wanted to walk us through 6.7 um, uh, with you. Okay, so essentially example, the previous example, 6.6, .6, not the one we looked at a few minutes ago, but the kind of one between here, um, provides a water sample with this table here. And it says, okay, these are expressed as milligrams per liter with a pH of 7.5. So I kind of clipped in the, uh, the text there. So these are all in milligrams per liter at pH 7.5. So that's the water that we're dealing with. Um, and this, it says a utility treats 12 million gallons per day of that water 
um, to its maximum softness before distribution. So maximum softness, really that's talking about about 40 milligrams per liter as CaCO3. So the question, again, deceptively simple here, says A, how much lime and soda ash in milligrams as CaCO3 per liter must be must the utility add? Um, and so that would be, it must be a daily. So they're, they're asking what, how much in concentration. So we have a flow rate that's daily. I would, I would assume that's kind of a daily or I mean, I guess, I guess concentration that works. So we don't need daily. So that's just in the concentration form. Um, so given that amount of water, or given given that there's that stuff in the water, what concentration of the lime and soda ash do we have to add? Okay, and then B, what mass of softening sludge will the plant generate daily? So that's where that component will come in. Okay, so then the book launches into a two-page solution. <laughs> Um, that with lots of explanation and lots of text there um, to describe what's going on. Um, one of the things we're going to see is a kind of an interesting chart or figure that looks something like this. Actually, you know what? This is a, we'll just do, it's kind of a bar chart where we have concentration on the x-axis, and then we just have different, it's like a horizontal bar chart where we have different species, and we'll have, if you ever do this in a um, kind of analytical chemistry sense or geochemistry sense, you'll have, it, it shows a, a bar for cations and anions, and in a true system, if you're ever to look at, you know, kind of take a geochemistry look at a system of water, these should balance. And any imbalance would be an error on your part for measuring the water quality incorrectly. Now, we don't have enough information here, and they certainly don't balance in this example, but we would assume that the imbalances, they're not doing that thorough characterization that I'm talking about. Chloride in particular is hard to get a perfect read on. Um, and of course, maybe there's heavy metals or whatever, other things that are affecting the system. So the example is not gonna give us a perfect charge balance, but one thing that you can take a look at when examining the composition of a water is the charge balance and how close you got with your measurements to an effective charge balance. So anyway, they're gonna have kind of this type of a thing um, or something related. And then above that, they'll be showing different kind of different bars of different species that are contributing to those. So we'll, we'll get there in a moment. Just kind of wanted to uh, try to introduce that topic a little bit. Okay, so part A, how much lime and soda ash must the utility add? So this is going to get into these steps but really figuring out kind of a shorter way of, you know, solving for this requirement. And essentially what it's going to do is look at, okay, how much dissolved CO2 do we have? How much um, calcium carbonate hardness do we have? Each of these, each of these components that we're aiming to remove, how much is there in the system? And using that as a way to calculate the amount of stuff we need to add. Okay, so let's dive into it, see what they say. Okay, to solve this problem, the first step is to calculate the amount of CO2 aqueous that must be neutralized. So that's that step one, removal of dissolved CO2. Um, water, the water is, uh, excuse me, the water pH is 7.5 and its bicarbonate concentration was given in that previous example as 165 milligrams per liter. Got the dissociation constant, um, and essentially what we can do is solve for the amount of carbonic acid. They keep writing this as CO2 aqueous, 
So the same thing as writing H2CO3. Okay, so then we have that relationship and it's kind of nice. We don't even really need to make any assumptions about you know neglecting something based on the pH because there's really only one equilibrium reaction that has the H2CO3 in it. So we have that uh, relationship. We can make, you know, we can write that out and find how much is there. And so that's uh, pretty much the answer to that step one. Um, and then we convert it to as CaCO3. So we get some value there for that. And it says the second step is to draw a bar graph. And that's what I was mentioning a moment ago. Um, for the system, like the one in the in the figure that I'll show you in a moment, or actually that's referencing the, the previous example. In this example, they say we're going to abbreviate it just to deal with the things that we need right now. Um, so the former one was a little closer to charge balance. This one's just going to deal with these five steps of softening. Okay, show only the hardness components in particular. So <clears throat> only those those five hardness components, right? The CO2, the calcium carbonate hardness, magnesium carbonate hardness, calcium non-carbonate hardness, and magnesium non-carbonate hardness. So those are the only bars that are going to show because um, those are the one, only ones we're really interested in at this time. And so let me uh, adjust something real quick. My... Uh, Webcam was slightly too big. Okay, so based on the values um, in that bar chart that we're going to create, um, we can calculate a bit more simply um, with all of that. Okay, so it goes on. It's talking. It's referencing the previous problem a little bit. Um, okay. So it's talking about filling in a table, meaning this table in particular. So essentially this table is going to provide the data for the bar chart. So it doesn't, you could do one or the other, but essentially if you take a look, um, what, it's, what it's doing is saying, okay, what component are we talking about? So we have the CO2 and we have the calcium carbonate hardness magnesium carbonate harness, all of that. And here's that excess line that we have to add. And then we're looking at, okay, the concentration of the thing, the amount of lime that we have to add to remove the thing, the amount of soda ash that we have to add to remove the thing, and then the amount of solids in terms of CaCO3 that are going to precipitate or the solids of magnesium um, hydroxide that are going to precipitate. So each of these are relating to those five steps that we talked talked about. You know, you have to add some lime and occasionally some soda ash, and you're always going to be precipitating, or almost always going to precipitate calcium carbonate and or the magnesium salt. Okay, so that's that's the a table, and what it's talking about is just filling all that in accordingly. Here's the figure that they were talking about this bar bar chart where we have total hardness and we have um, kind of the, the uh, different components here. So we have some amount of it is carbonate hardness, some is non-carbonate hardness, that is calcium carbonate hardness, calcium non-carbonate, and magnesium non-carbonate hardness. And based on the values here, they're just taking a look and just drawing it up. We have 323 total hardness. Um, and you can you can define the different, you know, I, I mentioned at the start of class that, you know, I was, I was thinking maybe I should have given a more precise definition for the different hardness values. Well, really, if you take a look, this chart is going to explain it. So we have some total hardness that comes out to here. And you can look at the total hardness as the amount of CA2 plus the Mg2, it's two plus, right? Because um, that's our definition for hardness, right? It's 
essentially the amount of calcium and magnesium in a system. Technically, the other um, cat multivalent cations would, would add as well. But the simple solution is just looking at the calcium and magnesium. That's our total hardness. And so to break that apart into different, um, different components, well, we remove the excess um, CO2 that's dissolved. Then that's going to, you know, at that point, we have some amount of bicarbonate left. And so that bicarbonate is going to be, you know, however much calcium is in solution, when we add, when we, when we start removing calcium, it's first going to be removing calcium carbonate hardness. If that removes all of the calcium, then we're onto magnesium and we have some magnesium carbonate hardness. But what we see here is we have more calcium than we have bicarbonate. And so that means we're, we have no magnesium carbonate hardness. We have calcium carbonate hardness. We have some calcium non-carbonate hardness. That's this portion that just kind of made a note here. And then after that, we're removing magnesium. So if we go back to our five steps, and it'll, it'll reflect in this table in a second, we ha we removed the the excess CO2. Then we started removing this calcium carbonate hardness. That was taking out all that bicarbonate. And then we check to see if there's any magnesium carbonate hardness. And we didn't have any extra carbonate at that point. We were still removing calcium. So essentially, step three was non-existent. Um, step four continued uh, removing more calcium. And then step five removed the remaining magnesium. So I think we'll see that right here. The magnesium carbonate hardness was zero. And so we didn't have to add anything. That was the step three there. And that's shown because this carbonate was all removed before all the calcium was removed. So that was the deal. If this had extended to here, then we'd have some magnesium carbonate hardness as well. Okay, so more text. Um, let's try to read through it a little bit and make some sense of it. Okay, it's completing the table row by row um, in terms of calcium. Uh, let's see. Okay, it's explaining a lot of what I was just mentioning with a bit of detail about the calculations. Okay. okay, it's just going on about how essentially how to solve from these amounts. If you put all of them into into the um, milligrams per liter as CaCO3. And then essentially you generate this plot, um, then that's that's kind of the way to go. So let me erase these here. Okay. So it goes on about that and gives, gives that way. I would encourage you to take a look, um, closer look, make sure you have some understanding of that. I don't think you need it for the homework and I'm not gonna ask you to to do something this involved on an exam. I will try to ask something that's um, a reasonable application of this type of knowledge, um, but not to the scale that this problem is uh, <laughs> going through. Um, okay, so then let's just conclude with taking a quick look at part B. This is just essentially mass balance. Once you know how much solids are being produced, 12 million gallons per day, um, what's that mass balance in terms of the, that amount of solids? milligrams per liter convert that and you get 25,000 kilograms every day um, so quite a lot uh, and oftentimes these uh, solid sludge stuff it's mostly water so you have have to do a lot of dewatering in order for it to be economical to actually remove that and go and landfill it and stuff okay so that's all for today um, See you guys on Thursday.